that since the Prophet Muhammad himself participated in many battles and raids and did indeed perpetrate these beheadings, he ordered the assassination of several of his political opponents and he uh, behaved in general like a typical 7th century warlord. The problem is that when this is transferred to 21st century behavior, 21st century contexts of behavior, then what you get are terrorists. The Quran occupies a place that has no parallel in Western civilization. The Quran is considered by Muslims and by traditional Islamic theology to be dictated word for word by God himself, by Allah himself, through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad. As a result, every word of it is the words of God himself. Every word of the Quran, unless it is canceled by another section of the Quran itself, is valid for all time and cannot be questioned cannot be reformed, cannot be changed within an Islamic context. This means that moderate Muslims, peaceful Muslims, if they are sincere, have to reject entirely Quranic literalism. But to do so puts them outside the sphere of anything that has been considered orthodox Islam throughout history. Because to do so is to reject the very basic premise of Islam that this is a book that is dictated by God and is a perfect copy of a perfect book, the Umm al-Kitab, the, the mother of the book that has existed forever with Allah in heaven. The Noble Quran, translated with parenthetical notes by Dr. Muhammad Taqi Uddin al-Hilali and Dr. Muhammad Musin Khan. Surah 98, verse 6. Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun, other disbelievers, will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. So the Quran is simply a set of uh, direct commandments or else narratives, descriptions, sometimes very distorted descriptions of uh, Judaism and Christianity. Because of the normative nature of uh, th those commandments, uh, the second important body uh, for Islamic jurisprudence and for Islamic uh, uh, polity is the tradition of the Prophet, the Hadith. Now the Hadith are absolutely necessary to make any sense of the Quran because Allah addresses Muhammad in the Quran and they talk about incidents in Muhammad's life but they don't fill in the narrative details so you have to go to the Hadith the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad in order to understand what's being said in the Quran and why the Hadith are many many volumes of traditions of the Prophet Various Muslim scholars, beginning in the 8th century, which is some considerable time after the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, who died in 632, they started to collect these traditions and to try, through various means, to winnow out the authentic ones from the inauthentic. From an Islamic standpoint, if something that Muhammad said or did is recorded in one of those books, then it has authority second only to the Quran. And in those books, there is a great deal that illuminates what the Qur'an says and how it is applicable to Muslims in the present. Authoritative Traditions of the Prophet Muhammad The Hadiths of Sahih al-Bukhari Translated with parenthetical notes by Dr. Muhammad Musin Khan Volume 4, Book 52, Hadith number 53. The Prophet said, Nobody who dies and finds good from Allah in the hereafter would wish to come back to this world even if he were given the whole world and whatever is in it.
except the martyr who, on seeing the superiority of martyrdom, would like to come back to the world and get killed again in Allah's cause. The Prophet said, a single endeavor of fighting in Allah's cause, in the afternoon or in the forenoon, is better than all the world and whatever is in it. Since there is no sense of natural morality in Islam, you have to go into either the Quran or the Hadith to find out what is allowed and what is not allowed. And in those books we have very clear instructions from the Prophet Muhammad that it is uh, the responsibility of Muslims to meet the unbelievers on the battlefield, to invite them either to accept Islam or to accept second-class dhimmi status, dhimmi status in the Islamic State, and if they refuse both of those, then to wage war against them. Fight against those who believe not in the law, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. And fight against those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, Islam, among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, the poll tax, with willing submission, and feel themselves subdued. The Qur'an is broken down into two sections. One is called Makkiya, which means what was inspired to Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, in Mecca. And one is called Madaniya, what was inspired to the Prophet of Islam in Medina or Yathrib. In Mecca, you find much of the peaceful verses. Muhammad used to live with the Jewish community and the Christian community in peace and harmony. So there was many verses uh, in the Quran that uh, even the Muslims used to worship in the direction of prayer towards Jerusalem. They saw many elements of a unity between the Jewish and the Christian and the Muslim faith. There are indeed some verses in the Quran that could be called peaceful and tolerant. Uh, notably uh, the injunction against uh, compulsion in religion. Those verses uh, almost invariably date back to the beginnings of Muhammad's prophetic career in his native city of Mecca, where he was powerless, where he was only beginning to attract followers. Only few relatives and, and friends uh, accepted the religion at that time. And he had many foes, so the, the revelations of, of that time were very peaceful. Well, it all changes with the establishment of Muhammad's theocratic statelet in the city of Medina. He becomes a warlord, he becomes the head of a totalitarian state, he becomes very rich, very powerful, and very intolerant. And then many of these early verses, in fact, get abrogated. In Surah 2, verse 106 of the Qur'an, it says, or Allah says, I should say, that if we abrogate, we being Allah, abrogate a verse, then we'll give you one that's better. Whatever a verse, revelation, do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring a better one or similar to it. Know you not that Allah is able to do all things. This is the basis, the foundation, of the Quranic doctrine of Nasih, which is abrogation. And it is the idea that when there are verses that are contradictory or appear to be contradictory in the Quran, the one that is revealed later chronologically is better, as Allah has promised, and cancels the earlier one. Now the violence started. Now you had to weigh between peaceful verses and non-peaceful verses. So the edict was that these were made null and void. It is indeed a very curious concept for a non-Muslim to accept the notion that God may change his mind about a topic and may issue one injunction uh, in uh, AD 614 and then a very different one in AD 627. But this is indeed what has happened in Islam. It's very important to understand that the Quran is not arranged chronologically. It's arranged on simply on the basis of the longest chapter to the shortest.
And so you will find in the book itself some of these more tolerant verses at a later point in the book than the very intolerant ones